All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the first tutorial for our advanced web. Um, just hoping everyone's in the right place. Uh, so this is what we're here for. Uh, I'm basically going to put uh, most of the content for tutorials on uh, a blog that I've set up, uh, mainly because it gives me a bit more flexibility with what I can put up there um, compared with putting stuff up on the blackboard. Um, so this is the address here if you want to uh, go to that site and if you want to navigate to uh, KRB216 tutorials in week 2 uh, then you'll find a few different posts basically on what we're going to cover today. Uh, so just as a general kind of overview, uh, these first few weeks will be f focused on basically helping you complete your first assignment, which will be the creation of your own portfolio WordPress site um, with, with the intention that you sort of use that and, and continue that on uh, after, after the end of this subject and, and after your time at QUT. Uh, so hopefully it's, it's something that will you can continue with perpetually uh, and that you continue to keep building upon. All right, so so I'll, I'll sort of leave it until next week before we start getting into kind of you know PHP and, and WordPress and all that sort of stuff. Today I really want to focus more on uh, some of the processes that you need to go through to set up your web server, um, look at some of the tools uh, that you can use, uh, talk about um, you know, your own sort of individual process that you will develop for yourself uh, to go from the very beginning phase to the completion of a web design project. Um, and uh, for, the, for the majority of the class I want to do an exercise basically just uh, to make sure everyone's comfortable with your your core HTML and CSS principles. So uh, there's a few posts here. I'm going to sort of go through with them in the, in a bit of the reverse order that they're listed in. Um, but I might start with uh, let's start with this post here uh, on web hosting and domain name registration. So short of you know, definitively requiring that you have it, we're going to strongly, strongly recommend that you uh, purchase your own external web hosting for this subject. Um, uh, and there's several good reasons for that, which I'll elaborate on later. Um, and so basically that, but the main one being that if this is going to be a portfolio website, you're obviously going to want to still use it after QT, so you don't want to have your portfolio website on QT where no one can access it. <clears throat> but anyway, we'll go through um, a bit of a process for anyone who's never done that before, and I'm kind of taking the, the standpoint uh, of assuming that you haven't. Um, if you have that, that's great. Um, that's fine, but um, basically you're going to need two things. You're going to need web hosting and you're going to need a, a domain name. So the web hosting uh, is essentially space on a, on, on a web server somewhere hosted by a company that that's what they do. They host websites. Um, and so you'll put all your stuff on there and that's where it will be accessible over the internet. Um, rather than kind of specifically recommending any particular um, providers, um, what I've done is uh, I've given you a few links there uh, to basically different forums and, and different sites that uh, sort of uh, aggregate and categorize uh, various different uh, hosting, uh, hosting providers and hosting plans. So um, as part of your kind of work to do between this week and next week um, will be to research various different plans, find one that suits you and, and set up some web hosting so that we can start using it hopefully in, in, in the coming weeks. Um, so 
Uh, I won't go through them now, but um, that, that a good starting point would be to look at some of those sites. Um, you know, talk to people who have hosting and, and, and see what they have, see if they think it's good. Um, uh, and yeah, basically just weigh up a few different options and decide which one you want. Um, now whichever hosting company you decide to go with, uh, you'll generally find that they sell a bunch of different hosting packages. Uh, so this is a screen grab from one example uh, hosting company called uh, Quadra. And if you click on that image or link to their page, you can see basically you'll see a similar sort of features page on any hosting company and they, they tell you all the different things uh, they offer. So you can see they offer a bunch of different plans which range in price generally based on the features that they offer and also things like how much um, how much physical hard drive space you get on the web server and how much monthly traffic or bandwidth you're allowed. Um, so what you'll probably generally find is that for, for your purposes, unless your site becomes, you know, really amazingly popular and, and gets a lot of hits or you have a lot of heavy multimeter content on, some, or, on it or something, uh, you'll probably be able to make do with one of the, one of the more basic hosting plans. Um, so if we flip back to here, basically for the purposes of, for the purposes of uh, this semester anyway, uh, and what I imagine all that anyone would need for a, um, you know, for the, the foreseeable future, and you can always upgrade later, but the only two requirements we really need for this semester are, are the features that will allow us to install WordPress on the server, because you're going to be creating a portfolio website in WordPress. Um, and if you look at the uh, WordPress server requirements page, uh, it basically says there's only two requirements. One, that it has PHP version 5 um, or higher, and MySQL. So PHP being the scripting language and uh, MySQL being the database. Uh, and the, the WordPress framework uses both of those. Uh, so you'll find that they're pretty common features on even, even the basic plan. So if we jump back and look again at this page, uh, if we scroll down, you can see under this section here, databases, that the first plan doesn't offer any databases, but basically from then on up, uh, it does offer you MySQL databases. And if we scroll down a bit further, all right, we can see here that uh, it also provides uh, PHP. Not for the, again, not for the first plan, but for every plan after that. So if you're going to go with this hosting company, basically you'd want to discount that very first single domain basic plan and, and look at, at some of the others. Um, and those, those features, if they're not, they should generally be listed on the features page of any web hosting company, and if they're not, you should be able to email them and, and, and you know, ask about them as well. Um, but they're very, very common features. You shouldn't have any trouble finding a relatively cheap plan that has them. Okay, so after you've kind of done your research and you've decided what hosting package you want, um, once you purchase the, the, the web hosting, you will most likely, or you'll definitely, you'll get an email, a set up email that looks something like this, and it contains a whole bunch of information that you need to know in order to log into your web hosting and administer it, set it up, and all this sort of stuff. Um, so you can see it, it has a, a control panel account. The control panel is basically a web interface for administering uh, your website, so it allows you to do things like setting up databases and um, you know setting up domains and that kind of thing. Uh, you get details for logging into your web server via FTP, um, so that you can upload your files to the website uh, and any other sort of information that you need to know to uh, administer your account. You should get in that email. And for anything else, they should provide you a, a support email that you can request know, any sort of help. So that's the web hosting, that's the first part, that gives you space on a web server where you can store your website. Um, the second thing you want is uh, a domain name. 
Um, so I guess technically you could have a website without a domain name. Uh, every website is actually identified by an IP address. So for example, up here, google.com, you can actually um, you can actually type in that IP address and it will result to the Google website. Okay, but obviously the idea of having a domain name is that it's easier to remember than a, a, a string of numbers. So you'll most likely want to uh, have that. And basically the, the, the purchasing of a, or the registering of a domain name is going to be, you know, even simpler than setting up web hosting because, you know, there's only really one feature. It's the fact that they, you know, hold this particular name for, the, for your sole use um, for a period of time. So um, basically you're going to find that they're, they're, they're much of a muchness. There's not going to be that much difference between them. Um, but one thing you will find is that depending on which uh, domain suffix that you want, you'll probably pay different amounts. Um, and by that I mean if you want a .com domain because it's kind of the most popular, you'll probably pay more for a .com domain than a .net domain or a .org domain. Um, so there's all sorts of different ones. You can, you can basically choose whatever you want, but if you, um, if you follow this link here, uh, you can see a list of all the different internet, what they call top level domains that you can get. Um, so you should, you can basically, there's nothing to really stop you choosing any top level domain you want, but you should be aware that each one is designed to have the connotation that your website is a particular type. So for example, .com is meant to signify a commercial website, um, .org is meant to signify an organisation, .edu is meant to be an ed educational organisation, .gov, government, that kind of thing. Um, so some do have restrictions on, on what you can do, but others just sort of have, um, you know, this is what they're suggested for. Um, otherwise, it, it doesn't really matter what, you know, what 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 um, domain extension you get. Um, I've provided again, um, rather than necessarily recommending any particular one domain name registrar, um, a bunch of links to forums and so forth. Um, by far the, the largest and most popular one is, is GoDaddy, so um, if you don't really care too much who you go with, uh, that might be a good place to start. Um, I, I don't think you'll find anywhere near as much variability in the, in the the pricing on domain name registration as you might with uh, web hosting. Uh, one thing, one thing to note though, if you do want a, if you do want to get a .com.au domain, uh, I believe that uh, you're required to have a, an ABN, Australian Business Number, in order to get that. If you don't supply that with your request, then you can't get it. Um, so that's just another thing maybe to consider. All right, so you've purchased your web hosting and you've registered a domain. Um, now what you need to do is basically make it so that your new domain name points to your web server so that when people type it in it will point point to uh, your website. <clears throat> now uh, some sometimes uh, you can get web hosting packages that include domain name registration um, so if you want to do that all in one package then then you can um, and in that case the domain name um, pointing to your website should already be set up. Um, but if you buy your domain name from a third party domain name registrar, uh, then basically there's a, a reasonably simple process that you have to go through to make your domain point to your, your web hosting. Um, and again, you should get instructions on how to do that from either or both of your web hosting company or the domain name registrar. But generally what it involves is uh, the web hosting company will have um, have what's called their their name servers, and basically their job is just to take a take a URL and then route it to the correct um, web page or web server. Um, and so you can get those you can get those name servers from the settings of your web hosting. Then you go to the domain name registrar, log in with your account, and then put those name servers in there. Um, so I won't really go through that in a huge amount of detail, but I've provided a link to um, a, a very detailed uh, description of all that. So between what you should get instruction-wise from 
um, you know, from the companies that you, you're buying the domain and the web hosting from, and, and this link, you should should be all right with that. Um, but if anyone needs help with that later on, uh, I can help you as well. Uh, so I've got a little bit of a FAQ down here of, of kind of common questions that people ask about uh, this stuff. And so the first one is how much can you expect to pay for hosting plus domain name registration? Uh, and you know, basically, it's the same with it's the same with everything. You you kind of get what you pay for. The super super cheap ones, you can assume they won't have as good service, um, that sort of thing. Um, but you really don't need one of the expensive packages. There's no point paying for features and bandwidth that you're not using. Um, so as a rough ballpark, I would say if you were to purchase web hosting and a domain name for one year, I would say around about $100 for a year of web hosting and, and say $10 uh, for domain name registration. Um, so they, and I mean these packages, they kind of work similarly to how a phone plan will work. You end up paying, you know, a little bit less if you, if you pay for a year in advance versus paying monthly or paying weekly, that kind of thing. Um, now another good way to reduce the cost is um, if you have a friend or, or a couple of friends who you know you kind of know quite well and trust and what you could do is you could all split one hosting package between you so you could get uh, for example if I go back again to this page there are certain plans which allow uh, multi-domain hosting so what you can do is you can actually have one web server that has several websites on it uh, and then each person purchases a, a separate domain name and they all point to different folders on that web server um, and that's a good way of splitting the cost of the web hosting uh, at least that's what I've got going at the moment with uh, this website so my website is really just a subdomain of this if90.net website so these two websites plus a bunch of others are all hosted on the one web server and we split the cost between us and um, you know whoever wants to buy their own domain name just buys a domain name we point it to a particular folder on that website. Um, okay so um, that's you know rough ballpark figure. Uh, the, the other thing I guess to consider if you've got more multiple people going in on the one hosting package is that you know the traffic is going to increase because if you've, if you've got three websites and you're going to have three times as much traffic that sort of thing but um, uh, generally that's not an issue and they usually always let you upgrade to a higher package if you need to if you start using more bandwidth or more, more hard drive space and so forth. Okay so the next FAQ is um, I'm just a poor student why should I have to pay for this? Um, so if you, if you really, really, you know, are totally against paying for this, you can, if you want, um, use the student server. Um, but as we'll look at in the next question, there's, there's some very good reasons not to do that. Um, but basically think of it this way. Uh, if, you, if you just want to uh, do this for the, the course of the semester, then all you really need to do is buy hosting for the duration of the semester, let's say four months, 16 weeks, uh, and you know you can do that on you can do that for around about fifty dollars less if you split that between people, and so you know that's the equivalent of the cost of a textbook or less than the cost of a textbook, which we don't require you to buy. So you can kind of think of it as you know the textbook cost for for this uh, this subject. Um, so yeah, if, but if that's still you know if that's still too much for you, you can if you want use the QUT uh, web server. Um, but you know think of it as an investment because you will I can almost guarantee you that you will down the track want to have a portfolio website after you've left QUT. So you may as well set it up now rather than having to then go and pull it out of the QUT server and migrate it to a new one once you leave. So reasons why not to just use the, the QT CIF student web space. Um, basically the biggest one is that you want people outside of QT to be able to see it. Uh, if you host anything on the QT web space, 
someone's going to need a QT login in order to see it. Um, you know, there's, there's extra lockdown security, and so there's not as much flexibility with configuring your server. Um, and uh, to be brutally honest, any problems that you're going to have with your web server will be dealt with much more swiftly by uh, an external hosting company who, who you're paying for their service uh, than, than the IT help desk here. Um, so, you know, I guess I can't recommend strongly enough that you do get your own external web hosting. Uh, next question is, can you use a hosting provider from another country? The answer to that is yes. Um, there's effectively, functionally at least, no difference between how operating your site uh, on an on a offshore web server would would um, compared with a with a domestic web server, um, and in fact, with the current exchange rate, it might end up being cheaper. But um, there are some things that you do have to consider, like if you're expecting to make use of telephone support, then you might rack up a big international phone bill, and you've got to think about things like you know, um, you know, different time zones. So if they're doing if they're doing maintenance to their servers, and they're in America, and they're doing it when you know no one's online in America, then that might be your peak time in Australia. So there are, there are, thing, there are things to think about there, but it is certainly possible um, to use uh, offshore hosting. Uh, another question that's commonly asked is, you'll see generally hosting providers offering you either a, a Unix or a Windows-based server. And the first thing to make note of is that this has nothing to do with the operating system that you're running on your computer. This is what's running on the server. Um, and so it has, the two have no bearing really on each other. There's no compatibility issues. Uh, the most common the most common platform is, is a Unix server. Uh, you, could, you could probably use either, but um, unless you specifically want to use or need to use Microsoft technologies like uh, like their ASP scripting language or something like that, then your default option is probably going to be the Unix server. You probably find it's a little bit cheaper anyway because they usually use Linux, which is licensed for free, um, as opposed to a uh, Windows server, which they would have to pay for. Um, so the short answer to that is, um, unless you specifically need Microsoft stuff, which for this semester you don't, uh, would go to the for the Unix server. And as I said, you can always change it later on. Um that probably it probably depends on the policy of each hosting provider. What they would probably do is keep it for a certain amount of time and then keep sending you emails going, hey do you want to renew, hey do you want to renew? And then if you didn't they probably would delete it. But you can, I mean if you you can choose to change your hosting provider or whatever, you just download all your files, grab your databases and migrate them to a new server. Um, yeah, so they're not allowed to, you know, hold your data ransom or anything. Uh, and the last FAQ I have here is, uh, can I have more than one domain name pointing to my website? And the answer again is yes, you can. Uh, in fact, it's quite common for uh, companies and organisations to buy up, um, you know, all, all sorts of top, dev top level domains uh, for their company, uh, you know, to avoid other people sort of pilfering their, their traffic. Um, so, for example, if you look at a site like Google, um, the, the URLs google.net, google.biz, um, all those sort of top level domains, they'll all redirect to google.com and they've even bought common misspellings uh, of their name like G-O-G-L-E and G-O-O-G-E-L dot com. Um, so you probably don't need to go to that extreme, but if you do really kind of want to retain your identity, you could buy, say, maybe the dot com and the dot net version of uh, your website. So that again, with this website here, I'm pretty sure we have the uh, if90.net and if90.com both resolving to the same website. Okay, so we've got if90.com, we've bought that as well and it just redirects to if90.net. And that just 
kind of stops anyone else from setting up a, a website called if90.com and, you know, misrepresenting themselves. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions about hosting and domain names that I might add to the FAQ list? No? Okay, so that, that'll be sort of one of your homework things over the next week is to look at, have a look at some of these links, do your own research, ask around, uh, and try and preferably by next week's class have uh, hosting and domain name, if not by next week then definitely by the week after that uh, because we're going to start looking at um, installing WordPress. Um, so it's going to be much easier if we can do that on your external hosting from the beginning rather than having to do it on your student server and then migrating it across. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, the next thing I want to look at is this post on web design and development tools. Okay, so again, with with this sort of section, I don't necessarily want to impose any specific set of tools or specific set of processes um, upon you, but uh, what I do want is for everyone to kind of um, figure out what is their own, uh, you know, process and tool set and workflow for going from the, the start to the finish of a web design project. Um, so I, I've just outlined here some of the, the, the common tools that, that people use. Um, so, you know, feel free to pick and choose from any of these or add your own ones uh, or anything like that. But the first one I'll talk about is um, not necessarily something that you might think of as a web, web design or web development tool, but um, you should make sure not to underestimate um, you know, the importance of the early research phase of a web design project. Um, so you should be doing a lot of research, looking at other websites, doing, you know, target, target user research, creating timelines, Gantt charts, you know, site structure, tree maps, that kind of stuff. So you're going to need somewhere to store all of this information. Now, a, a pen and a paper might work perfectly well for you, that's that's fine. Um, but there's also some really good digital tools for sort of collecting of notes. Um, two of those, two popular ones are um, Evernote, which is uh, both cross-platform, uh, and it also has a free version, which is very nice. Uh, and then there's Microsoft OneNote, which I'm not sure if it still comes by default with Microsoft Office or not, um, but it's another similar one. But that one's um, that one's commercial only and and Windows only. Uh, so this is a screenshot of Evernote here, just to show you what the interface looks like. Um, basically, you can collate your notes, tag them, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but some some sort of um, organizational process for storing your early on research and stuff is going to be very important. Uh, number one, because you know, really, the more time you put in at the beginning, you will save multiples of that time at the end by by doing that extra planning. And second of all, as as part of your assignment, not only do I want to see the your finished portfolio website, but I want to I want to see that you've considered and and documented your own um, workflow, your own process as well. Um, so. You know, I, I want you to keep things like mock-up sketches and wireframes and that sort of stuff, and I want you to submit that as a, as a document along with the actual website, so that I can see that you've started to develop these tool sets and these these processes for yourself. Uh, you'll obviously need a code editor, um, and really anything that can save a text file will will do the job. So note, note, Notepad will do the job if you want, and then some people, some people still use it. But uh, uh, as you kind of continue along, you'll probably find that even something with fairly basic uh, features like, say, syntax highlighting and and you know being able to format code on multiple lines, simple stuff like that is going to 
uh, you know, increase your efficiency a lot more. It's going to make the, the code that you've written or other people's code that you're looking at a lot more comprehensible. Um, and, you know, there's lots of free editors out there that have those basic features. Um, and then you can go all the way up to sort of a full-blown IDE or integrated development environment, uh, which adds all sorts of other features. So again, I, I'm not necessarily going to dictate to you what you should and shouldn't use here, um, except to say that, you know, just because something has more features doesn't mean it's going to make you more efficient. If you're not using those features, they tend to get in the way and clutter up the interface. Um, so I would say look at a few different things uh, and, and figure out what works best for you. I've put a screen cap uh, and a link to a, a table from Wikipedia which lists a whole bunch of these editors, including sort of open source free and commercial ones. Um, I think, uh, and just just a quick word on on something like like Dreamweaver. I know I know Dreamweaver gets criticised a lot for its sort of graphical editing um, graphical editing stuff. You know, it's what you see is what you get stuff, and people do it, and it ends up outputting atrocious code. Um, but Dreamweaver itself has become actually quite a powerful IDE. So if I, I I've got no problem with you using Dreamweaver as long as you're kind of using it as a as a coding tool rather than, you know, drawing in your elements visually. Um, I think on these computers here they have a pretty decent um, IDE called uh, Komodo Edit, uh, which you can find under Programs and Web Applications and Browsers. Uh, so that's probably the one to use if you're working on these computers, um, but really you can use whatever you want. Okay, so moving on uh, is you'll need uh, an FTP client. Uh, and this is something that you may or may not have used, uh, you know, with your, with your intro to web uh, assignments. With intro to web, you're just creating static websites, so feasibly you could have just submitted that as a zip file, and then whoever was marking it opened up from the hard drive. Uh, when we start creating dynamic websites, you can't do that anymore. You can't just open up a PHP file in the web browser and expect it to, to work. Uh, it has to be running on a web server that has the, uh, the PHP engine and the, and the database engines running on it. So uh, in order to actually see your websites working, you'll need to upload the files to the web server and then go to your website in the browser and test it that way. So what you will need is, is something like an FTP client, a file transfer protocol client, uh, which essentially allows you to do that. It's, it, if you look at the interface, it, it looks just like, you know, it's all Windows Explorer or the Mac Finder. It's, it, it's, it's a file browser, essentially. The only difference being instead of browsing files on your hard drive is that you're um, browsing files on a remote computer across a network. Um, so you need three bits of information to log in uh, to your to FTP into your web server. Um, you, you need the, the host, uh, a username and a password. And those three bits of information you'll, you'll be given in that setup email and you should be able to create more FTP user accounts uh, in the control panel for your web server as well. So once you're logged in, you can basically just treat it like it's another folder on your computer. You can, you know, drag and copy files to it, delete them, download them, edit, re-upload, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, going back to remembering last year's intro subject, I think it's one of the sites using files a lot to go to the I'd say there'll be less of a lot of those kind of problems, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's FTP client. Uh, I think on these computers they've got one called, uh, again under the programs, web applications and browsers, Core FTP Lite. You'll generally find that um, the interfaces for every FTP program looks very similar. It'll be a place to log in and then file, uh, you know, basically the file browser. 
But again, it doesn't really matter what you use. Um, FileZilla is just kind of another good one because it's it's free cross-platform. Um, just if you if you do get FileZilla, just make sure that you you're downloading the FileZilla client and not the FileZilla server, um, because that's both. Yep. So what's the difference between like keeping someone in power for CG or not? That will be, I guess, the PowerPC one will be if you have an old MacBook that has a PowerPC processor, or, or an old Mac that has, yeah, PowerPC. So you probably, unless you got a really old computer, you probably get an Intel one. Yeah. All right, so uh, that's FTP client. After that, obviously, you're going to need a web browser and likely multiple web browsers in which to test your uh, website. Uh, and I guess the, the one that's still fairly popular amongst web developers uh, is Mozilla Firefox as sort of the primary testing browser. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. I guess the first one because when it came out, you know, it was the only only major competitor to our Internet Explorer, and at the time, you know, Internet Explorer web designers complained that Internet Explorer had fairly poor uh, standards compliance, uh, and so compared to that, Mozilla's was quite good. Um, there's now a lot more browsers on the market and a lot better quality of standard compliance in all browsers across the board, but uh, I, I guess Mozilla's kind of retained that. I guess tag as the, the developer's browser. Um, the other reason being that, or, or maybe because of that, there's there's a bunch of quite useful uh, extensions for Firefox uh, that will help you with web design and web development. Uh, and the first one of these is possibly the, the the most useful, most powerful tool in your in your arsenal once you once you get used to using it. And I can't recommend strongly enough that you you get you, you get used to using Firebug because it will honestly increase your productivity unimaginably. Um, I guess it's I mean Fi Firebug looks like this. You you install it as an extension and and what you can do. I, mean, I should go over to our uh, Firefox so we can see what it looks like. Well, let's say I go to oh, let's, let's say I look at this. Uh, Let's say I look at this web page that I've been working on. Okay, and so what I can do is while I'm working on it, you'll know from creating static websites that the process of, of creating a website after you've kind of designed the wireframe and stuff, there's a lot of going back and forth between, you know, you'll type something in the code, save it, look at it in the web browser, need to change something, go back. A lot of back, back and forth stuff like that. Um, where Firebug comes in really handy is. Uh, you can basically shortcut a whole a whole lot of that stuff. So you open up Firebug and it gives you this interface like this, which allows you to inspect all these different elements uh, within the within the DOM, so the HTML structure, uh, and it also allows you to see the CSS. Uh, so I can do things like I mean I can if I want to find on this page what 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 this graphical element is referring to, I can right click it, go inspect element, all right, and it will take me to the part of the HTML where it is. And if I want to, if I want to, you know, do things like, uh, let's say, let's say I want to modify the padding, so this is a common one, let's say you're trying to figure out your paddings and margins and all that, and quite often you'll go back and forth between your editor and the web browser, you know, a hundred times trying to figure out the exact numbers for it. What I can do here is I can change these numbers and see it updated instantly on the website and so I can play around with these here much quicker until I figure out the exact values that I want and then once I've figured those out I can go back to my actual code files uh, or my actual HTML CSS files and then input those values. Uh, I can do things like uh, turning on and off various different elements so I can see what happens when I change this uh, list item from displaying uh, in line to displaying in a block. Okay, but the thing the thing to remember is these changes that I'm making are not permanent, okay? They're not 
There's no way that this can write back to my HTML files and save this. It's only modifying what I'm seeing in the browser like this. As soon as I refresh anything, okay, it's all going to disappear. But hopefully you can kind of see how that will save you a lot of time going back and forth between your code and refreshing the browser to figure out tiny little things. It's also really useful for things like um, quite commonly you'll, you'll, you'll see, um, you know, some inexplicable gap between two elements and you can't figure out why it's there uh, and most commonly that's because there's some element like a heading that's got you know sort of the browser's giving it a default margin a default padding so again I can I can use this uh, I can use this um, I can use firebug to basically let's say look at this heading one up here and if I just get rid of the the margin zero I had on it all right, I can see if I hover over, these colors actually have meaning. Uh, basically, the, the blue part represents the, um, the element itself. Uh, the yellow part represents the margin. And if I add padding, that should show up too. OK, and the purple part represents the padding. So I can see very visually exactly the physical space that it's taking up. So it's no longer so confusing that even though it only looks like it's taking up this much space, it's actually taking up more space because of that invisible uh, margin and padding. This is particularly useful for things like this where, um, where the browser will, if you don't specify it directly, the browser will apply its own margin and padding, um, often on things like uh, uh, you know, lists and headings and that sort of thing. And so it can be frustrating trying to identify where, where that, where all that stuff's not lining up. So that again is what it's really useful for. You could go to this layout tab and it'll give you, you know, these kind of exact metrics of saying, yep, that element is 385 pixels wide by 40 pixels tall, has 10 pixels of padding, and it's got 21 pixels of margin. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, heaps and heaps of other really powerful features. The console, when we start getting into uh, doing some JavaScript stuff, will be really useful for us. And you can add other, you can add the other extensions to it as well, like I've added this page speed extension, uh, which will analyze the, the performance of the, of the page, although it won't work right now because I haven't uploaded anywhere. Um, Basically, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of whole lot of functionality in there, and really the, the best way for you to uh, understand what it can do is just to install it and, and play around with it. So I strongly recommend for the sort of HTML, CSS exercise that we're going to do uh, today that you install it for that and, and use that as, as part of the process of doing that exercise just to get used to it. Um, the only other extension um, really worth a mention is uh, the web developer toolbar, which is actually available for uh, Firefox and Chrome now. Um, and there, there's a bit of crossover functionality between it and uh, Firebug. And again, the best way for you to figure out what it does is just to go to the website, look at the videos, install it. Yep. Ah, uh, yep, sorry, I should have said that too. Um, now, so, good question. Firebug equivalent for other browsers, um, basically based on the, basically based on the, the, the success and the popularity of Firebug, pretty much all the other browsers now have a similar thing built in. Uh, so Chrome, which I'm in now, yes, I can do the same thing. Go inspect element, right, and I have a very similar thing works slightly differently. I still feel like working in Firebug, I can work a bit bit quicker in that because it's easier to kind of edit things and so forth. But um, all the major browsers will have something like this now. It's generally called something like developer tools. Um, so if you're looking in the menu for it, it'll be like, so this one's view developer, developer tools. Um, so yes, Chrome has one, Safari has one, pretty sure that Internet Explorer has had one since about version 8 or maybe 7 uh, and Opera definitely has one as well so yeah if you do have an another browser that you prefer to test in then um, yeah they, they do have those as well um, okay so back to the web developer toolbar which 
Okay, so I've got it installed on Firefox here as well. And you can do things like uh, testing a website with JavaScript disabled. Uh, you can disable cookies, disable CSS styles. So that's useful to see if your, you know, what your web page is going to look like if, if if the styles fail to load. Um, you can disable images. Let's try that again. I'm not sure why that's working, but you, you can disable the images, you can do things like displaying the alt attributes, all this other sort of stuff. Um, so again, you probably won't use it as, as, as much as Firebug, but it it's, has quite useful features. Uh, there's another one, the um, resize, you can see what it looked like in a different size window. You can set pre predefined window sizes, so testing on different resolutions. Uh, and another really good tool is it has built-in validation. So it will send your code off to the validation servers and, and tell you if it's valid or not. So yeah, bunch of bunch of really useful tools there as well. Um, so I'll basically leave it up to you to uh, have a look at those and decide how they can help your workflow. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they're installed by default on these computers so you'll have to sort of um, download and install those extensions and restart Firefox and then work on it and it might wipe them once once the computer re-images. I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'll ask again and try and get them installed by default so that we don't have to do that but if you're doing any any sort of amount of, of, of work it's worth the, the, you know, the minute or two of taking that time to install them. One thing, um, you know that Maximal will come in, you definitely have to be careful of what you use, what you use, PC works and Mac works. Um, not, not really. I mean, the only thing is you can't really test on Internet Explorer if you're on a Mac, but you can't boot into Windows. Um, I no, I, I can't really think of anything. I mean, there'll, there'll be different software available for different ones, but I've, I no, I can't really think of anything that you need to be um, particularly aware of. I, I, I don't think there's any these days. I don't really think there's any difference in in how the rendering engines render, say, in Firefox on on Mac versus Firefox on a PC or. Chrome on a Mac versus Chrome on a PC, and it, in the Explorer isn't even on Mac anymore. So yeah, I I, I don't think so. Um, but that leads nicely into my next um, little part here, which is uh, how you end up testing on multiple browsers. Um, so when when it comes to testing on multiple browsers, I know there's varying schools of thought on, you know, yeah, you should test on absolutely everything, blah blah blah. Um, Really, it's 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 unfeasible that you're going to test on every browser, every version, on every platform. Especially now that there's you know all these mobile browsers, you're not going to go out and buy, you know, 200 different phones to test on all these different browsers, um, and even you know, two decades worth of, of versions of different uh, desktop browsers. Uh, so my suggestion would be sort of develop in your preferred browser. Uh, and when you sort of get get fairly towards completion level, I'd say start testing it in whatever other browsers you you can put on your computer. Um, and then once you've once you've done that, uh, if you want to see it working in other browsers as well, you can use there's there's a couple of services that you can use um, which will uh, allow you to see how your website will look in various different. Uh, other browsers. There's this one here called Browser Shots, and basically you enter the URL of a website. Uh, you check all the different browsers and versions of browsers on different platforms that you'd like to see your website rendered as, uh, and you hit submit. Uh, and it doesn't happen instantly because I mean they have to process their queue. You know, send it off to all their different 
hardware and browsers and then will sort of come back to you with a bunch of screenshots. Uh, if, if, you pay, if, you, if you pay for the premium service, I think you get priority, um, uh, you know, priority service, but um, either way, this is, this is not something that happens instantly. So this is something I would leave sort of towards the, the end-ish of your, of your development um, period. Once you've got it working on your, your main browsers that you're testing on, uh, on your computer, and when it comes to which browsers you're going to target, that's really something that you should include in your initial research. Uh, if you, you know, there's, if you think about it from a resourcing point of view, uh, you know, if you're, if if 95% of your users, or if only 5% of your users are using all these other web browsers, but it's going to double your budget in order to to test for those, then you know, there's got to be there's got to be a trade-off there somewhere. Um, so as part of your initial research, I would, you know, try and figure out what your user base is going to be, what platforms they're likely to, to view a website on, and what, what browsers they're likely to use. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you test as much as time and resources and all that sort of stuff will allow. Um, this, this is another one, Adobe Browser Labs, which is a bit newer than Browser Shots, uh, but does essentially the same thing. Uh, just that it, I think it requires an account, but it, it's still free. Um, again, it, it's, it's by no means instantaneous, but the nice thing about this one is what it does is you can get back all the images and it will overlay them in sort of like an onion skin kind of view. So even if there's very subtle differences between how your website renders on different browsers, you can see it quite easily if they're, if they're overlaid like that. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you look through that, but as I said, it's probably something that will come towards the end of your development cycle. Okay, and I guess what, one thing I forgot to add to this, which I should, is, um, you know, basically any tools for uh, compiling your documentation at the end, whether that's as a Word document or whether you set up another blog like a Tumblr or something to document your process. Um, I can't stress enough how important that whole documentation of your process is as well as the actual website that you create as well. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so for the rest of the class, um, based on Based on the other classes, we probably will actually need the, the, the whole rest of the tutorial to probably do this, uh, the HTML and CSS exercise. Uh, so I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go through that, but um, I'll just mention, in case you do finish it, what you can move on to. So we will do the HTML um, CSS exercise, but after that, uh, whether you get to this in class today or whether you do it throughout the course of the next week. Um, I want you to start thinking about your web design process. So I've got a post here. Um, again, I don't, I'm not going to dictate to you exactly what process you should use because, you know, different people work differently, different things work for different people. Um, but there tend to be a few different things that are common to, to most processes when it comes to web design. So, you know, things like doing your initial research, doing an inventory of the content that you're going to have, uh, doing, a, doing a sort of a, a site map or site structure, um, doing navigational design, doing wireframes, doing mood boards, mock-ups, style guides, all that sort of stuff. And then you might go and, uh, you might go and uh, take those mock-ups and then do them as static pages. And then you might take those and then convert them into a WordPress uh, template uh, and basically continue the development cycle like that. I mean, that's probably that's probably the sort of way I would approach it. Um, and it's probably the, a lot of that is probably the way that most people approach it. Um, but again, you know, whatever kind of works for you, but I just want to make sure that you are developing and documenting your, your process, your workflows, and your tool sets. Um, so if making a Gantt chart really helps you organize and control your time, then do that. Um, 
you know, whatever it takes. But um, I, I would suggest having a look at, 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 at least these articles and maybe some others um, and, and, and seeing what other people do and then starting to identify for this project, so treating this first assignment as your web design project, by sort of next week having your head how you're going to attack this as a process, how much time you're going to, and when you're going to spend it on the research, when you're going to do the visual design, and then the development and testing and so forth. And keep in mind when you're doing this sort of timeline things as well that um, there's going to be stuff that you're, you're not going to be out of very accurately estimate how much time it's going to take. Um, so there'll be some things that you're much, much sure of, but the things that you aren't, you know, you should leave more time than you think you might need. Uh, so I'll get you to look at that either after you've done the HTML, ex HTML exercise or throughout the week. Uh, and I've also provided just a link here um, as one of the first things that you're probably going to want to do is, is go and have a look at a whole bunch of other portfolio websites and critique them and, and see what works and see what doesn't work. So I've given you a few links of sort of collections of um, of portfolio website designs um, and so have a look at these do your own research as well um, but don't just passively look at them look at them and kind of critique them for yourself um, to say okay if that's good why is it good why is it a good functional portfolio website or equally if it's not um, why is it not um, and and make sure to keep in mind especially when it comes to the type of portfolio that you're going to create, that the context of the type of work that you do is going to be very important when thinking about the interface that you're going to design for your portfolio website. Okay, so look at these websites and, and, and look at, say, the portfolio of a photographer and, and think if that interface is necessarily going to suit the portfolio of a, a person who's purely a coder or something like that. Okay, so um, think very much in the context of, of what's going to what's going to be the content of your own portfolio. Okay, so on to the HTML and CSS core principles review. Basically, I want uh, I want to get you to do this exercise as a way of um, either making sure that you're comfortable with sort of those those core fundamental static HTML and CSS uh, skills, okay, because they're still going to be very much relevant to the work that we're going to be doing creating a WordPress theme. Um, and you know, the, the thing that I see so much of that, um, uh, you know, that I really wish I didn't was that people come up with these really beautiful visual designs, but they're then unable to translate it into, uh, you know, sort of the, the markup and the, and the code and that. Um, so I've, I've sort of created a, uh, I basically want you to create one static HTML page with a bunch of different stuff that's aimed to um, test yourself to see if you can, uh, it's mainly about laying stuff out on the page. So I'm not too concerned about making this look pretty or anything, um, but I just want to, I just want to make sure that you can use your, your HTML and your CSS skills to uh, to create a page that, that meets these specifications, yeah. Um, last year we did this subject was only HTML 3 or 4. Mm -hmm. This is talking about 5. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really mind if, if, if you use HTML4 or whatever. Um, in fact, you can use the HTML5 doc type and just write HTML4. Um, there, are, there are some new elements to HTML5 that you can look into if you want, but um, uh, really, I don't mind. Uh, if, if you're if you're more comfortable writing HTML4, then that's fine. Oh, I have no knowledge of HTML5. I don't have to use yeah. Well, but ba it's basically HTML4 minus a bunch of the bad elements that we didn't use anyway, plus a couple of new things. So it's if you, if you were to look at the code, it would look hardly any different at all. It's mainly the, the, the doc type declaration that's different. So I'm happy for you to do HTML4 um, or, or whatever you want. XHTML? Yeah, HTML4 or XHTML. Yeah, there's there's slight slight differences. It's it's just the, 
they're they're all very much the same. It's just um, you know, it's just slight differences like you know how you close off tags and so forth. So. I, re I really don't mind which version of, of um, HTML you use, as long as if you're using if you're using HTML or if you're using HTML4 or XHTML, um, I just suggest that you use a strict doc type so that when you're validating it, making sure that you're not using any of the bad stuff. Um, so an HTML5 or an HTML4 um, or an XHTML1 web page, I don't mind. Um, and basically, I want it to have the following things. I want it to be a center-aligned layout. Uh, doesn't mean I want all the text to be centered, but you know, I want sort of the, the margins on the left and right of the page. I want it, the, the content sitting in the middle. Uh, I want you to uh, include a tiled background image for the page body. Uh, and I want it to have, Cassie did a bit of a wireframe up here before, something like this. I want you to have essentially a, a header, navigation, middle section, and footer. Within the header, I want you to have uh, a logo. You don't need to design this logo or anything. Use a placeholder image if you want. Um, I want that to be, um, I want that to be a link, which basically links back to the same page. So it's like a website where you click the logo and it links back to the home page. Uh, I want it to have a heading one within that header section for the site name, and I want that to be aligned to the bottom right of that header header div or that header section. Uh, I want you to have a horizontal navigation menu underneath the header, uh, and I want you to create that using an unordered list. Um, so each of the navigation, uh, each of the menu items should be a, a, a list item. And with that, I want you to include um, visually different hover and uh, active states. So hover states, when I hover over each one with the mouse, I want it to visually change as, as some visual feedback. And I also want one of these links to basically have an active class to show that it's the current page that I'm on. Um, now these links here, you don't need to go and create those other pages, okay? They can just be links to nothing. You just do href equals hash. Um, okay, so that's the navigation. Then you'll have basically your content section and or your middle section. Within here, I want you to have basically three columns. Uh, I want you to have a left sidebar, a right sidebar, and a middle section for some content. Uh, within the left sidebar, I want you to have uh, a sub-menu, which is a, a vertical menu. Um, again, using uh, list items for the menu items. Uh, in the right sidebar, I want you to just have some sort of secondary content. I don't mind what that is. Um, yeah, text. And for, for any of the text, if you just want to use a lorem ipsum generator or anything, that's fine as well. Um, I'm only really concerned about your ability to lay out stuff on the page. Uh, in this main content section, I uh, want you to have a heading 2 for that um, article title. Then I want you to have some paragraphs of text. As I said, just use lorem ipsum if you, if you want. Uh, I've got a link there to a lorem ipsum generator. Uh, okay, now somewhere amongst these paragraphs, I want you to include one left aligned image and one right aligned image. So this is something this is something I see a lot of is um, a content section where it doesn't use all of doesn't use all of the available space and everything just kind of down the left. And it's usually because people haven't been able to figure out how they can use all of that screen space. So that's what I want: one left aligned image one right aligned image, um, and I want you to do that alignment with CSS. I don't want to see any um, deprecated HTML elements like um, like the align attribute. Uh, okay, on for, for one of those images, I want it to be a thumbnail which links to a large version of that image. And for uh, at least one of those images, I want it not just to be the image, but I want it to also be an image with a caption underneath it. So you need to think about how you're going to add sort of container divs around these elements in order to space those things out. Yep. You mean link to a different page, not a whole group page? 
uh, for the thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, I mean, have if it's a large image, take get a thumbnail version and then link that to the full size picture. Full size picture on a different page. Oh, it doesn't have to be on a different page. It can just be the the image file. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, all right, and then the footer section with a uh, copyright notice and uh, also some contact information amongst which you have a mail to link. So we can click on that and it will open up a, uh, an email to you. Okay, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I want it to be. I would suggest um, maybe doing a, a sketch up of a wireframe first, figure out what divs you're gonna need for all of that. Um, and once you've done that, I want you to make sure that your HTML and CSS uh, passes validation. So I've got links here to the W3C HTML and CSS validator. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, I will get you to do these two short quizzes from W3 schools. One's an HTML quiz and the other one is a CSS quiz. And basically, uh, I want you I want you to do this exercise, and I, I want you to do it from from scratch. So no starting with a Dreamweaver template or CSS layout generators or that. Uh, I want you to do it from scratch so that uh, if you do have trouble with anything, then you can identify that, and um, probably next week's tutorial we can go through any specific things that people had trouble with. Um, if we need to do that. Um, and then I've got some links. So if you do have trouble with anything specific over the next week, I'd recommend brushing up on whatever bits you need to um, using these W3Schools links for HTML and CSS. Um, so, uh, and Uh, I want you to. Uh, I want to make sure. I want you to make sure that you know you apply all the sort of best practices that you you learnt in uh, intro to web. Okay, so that means things like uh, separation of structure and style. So I want to see your uh, all the style information in CSS. I want it in a, uh, a external CSS file, which is linked to your HTML file. Uh, don't want to see any inline styles unless they're absolutely necessary. Uh, definitely no tables for layouts. Uh, I want you to use semantically meaningful markup. So call your class names and your ID names things like, you know, left sidebar, right sidebar, content rather than div one, div two, div three. Um, and I want you to make sure that you resize your images in Photoshop, not putting a huge image in the page and then sizing it down with uh, HTML or CSS and things like including alt attributes for your images. Um, and as I said, this would be good, this would be good um, exercise to practice using uh, those extensions like Firebug as well, so I'd highly recommend that.